I'll be pretty brief, but I want to start by taking you back to 2009. Um, for me, it's when I was transferred back from having spent 10 years overseas and moved into the Washington office of my company. Overseas and moved into the Washington office of my company. It was also when the Waxman-Markey bill was passed and trying to work its way through the Senate. And in 2009, the notion of what hydraulic fracturing even was, let alone what it was on the radar screen for most people. That's nine years ago. So major changes since then. 2009 is also when I met Karen Harbert at the uh, US Chamber of Commerce. And uh, pretty quickly, not, um, not in any other way than just being around Karen, very clear how knowledgeable she is, and uh, also how thoughtful she is about energy matters. And we're really lucky to have Karen here with us today. We would have been lucky even if the planes hadn't given us any trouble. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Karen. I think most of you know that she's president and CEO of the Chamber's Global Energy Institute, and they have a mission of building support for Global Energy Institute, and they have a mission of building support for meaningful energy action nationally and internationally through policy development, education, and advocacy. Uh, Karen's background includes testifying in front of members of Congress uh, repeatedly. She's been a member, is a member of the National Petroleum Council and the former, and um, her service in the government is included a former assistant secretary at the Department of Energy for Policy and International Affairs, and also former deputy assistant administrator for Latin America and the Caribbean at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Please join me in welcoming Karen. Well, let me beg your forgiveness. I'm sorry that I am so late. I, in reading everybody's bios, what an impressive group. So I'm particularly uh, humbled to have been so late. But uh, we have a diverse set of background and a diverse set of views, which is why we're all here. But there's one thing I am certain we can agree on, that LaGuardia is awful. <laughs> that LaGuardia is awful. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, so uh, my apologies. So with that, I, I normally would sit here and we tell a few jokes and get to know each other. We have zero time for that. So I'm going to jump right in and then let's have a discussion, you know, right afterwards. And I come at them and I think that's great uh, because that's how we build better policy platforms and better outcomes uh, both here and abroad. So let me see if I can master this. I wanted to start because we're all looking at things so much in our own individual lanes so much of the day uh, that sometimes it takes us just take a step back, take a day, uh, that sometimes it takes us just take a step back, take a step out, and let's do some situational awareness of where we are and where we're going and then work backwards to what that means for us today. I like to take us to the middle part of this century. Uh, and level set where we're going to be, you know, in, in that fee, you know, in, in that far away. And, and uh, it's actually not that far away. But in 2050, you know, the, the America's GDP is, I'm sorry, the world's GDP is going to go up by about 250 percent, uh, which is really hard to fathom. Electricity demand is going to outpace uh, transportation fuel demand. And the world's pipe, we're going to add 2 billion people to this planet. Uh, and seven of those nine billion people are going to live in cities. They're going to require a lot of infrastructure, a lot of energy. And of course, we're not really sure about what this means for overall energy demand. And I, you know, I've done a lot of forecasting in my life. And I can tell you, anybody that is giving you a definitive forecast out to 2050 is just dead wrong. We don't know. Uh, because there are so many variables. I mean, you know, I love to, you know, remind my friends at the EIA, at the Energy Department, they get it wrong every year. Uh, but that's their intent. They're trying to make best guesses, but we're getting it wrong. So what we do know, and the only thing we know is tectonic change, tectonic change between now and 2050. And that will have a huge, uh, you know, signal to the commodity markets of how they responded that in the next 20 or 30 years. Let's bring it in about 10 more years so we get a little bit more real. Uh, we can argue about these numbers, but they're directionally correct. By 2040, you know, today, electricity demand is still outpacing transportation fuels, but it's still growing at 75%. Today, we got a billion and a half people without any access to modern forms of energy. And I think all of us uh, would like to see that change uh, to reduce the energy poverty gap around the world. 
And we all know it's going to take a heck of a lot. It's going to take a heck of a lot of money, a heck of a lot of investment in all forms of energy and infrastructure to meet this demand growth. The question I think for us and looking at it on a macro sense is where's the money coming from and where's it going? How much of it is coming here and in what form? Uh, and, and that's something that uh, we think a lot about over time. And I'm going to go and, and that's something that uh, we think a lot about over time. And I'm going to go really quick through this. We have time for questions. So where's this all this demand coming from? You all know it. It's not the left hand part of this slide, which is the OECD and, and some other countries like you know, Russia, it's the right-hand part of the slide, the developing world. China is today the world's largest consumer of energy, and they've been planning for that. Uh, every five-year plan for the last five five-year plans, energy has been at top of the list of the Chinese leadership. They want to invest in every form of energy, every technology, every continent, and they've done it. Uh, what is on that slide that is easier, that's harder to tell is where is this harder to tell is where is this going? Uh, I would say to you the next couple of decades internationally is going to be marked by India. Today in India, we have 400 million people that have no access whatsoever to any form of modern energy. That's the equivalent of the U.S. and Germany's population combined. Uh, they have nine people in India with no access to refrigeration. And why is that important? Because that leads to huge foodborne illnesses and vaccinations that aren't kept cold and therefore additional health, benefit, health risks. So the government of India has made energy job number one, and that will largely shape for some time what type of demand uh, in India. What is harder to tell about that is the Middle East. You know, we've gone through Arab winter, Arab spring, Arab, we don't know what we are in, but tectonic change in the Middle East. And what that means is for the resource rich countries of the Middle East, the OPEC countries of the Middle East, they're having to make changes uh, to meet the demands of their new jobs, new industries. We see Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia, investments in new forms of energy, but also new industries. And in industries is really important because that means they're spending more of their molecules in their own countries now. And it means they need to find new markets for those molecules as well. And it's not the left-hand part of this as well. And it's not the left-hand part of this slide. They're having to do, you know, develop new trading relationships. There is a reason why uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Chinese and the, and the Saudis just had a big summit together and made some very important investment decisions because those are new customers for the Middle East. So the left hand 1.3 billion people, the OECD countries, right? And the other parts of the demand where the demand is growing is the rest of that 7 billion people. So we need to sit here from a little bit of a, of a stance of humbleness of where things are going, that we may have a very important role, but things are going to be happening in, around, and just that I think we have to be. We can't dictate the world's future of energy. We will be part of the demand picture, part of the supply picture. I think most importantly, and I think that's other something else we probably all agree on, is we can probably accelerate the pace of change in technology, but we're not going to change the absolute pie as big. Something else we probably all agree on is we can probably accelerate the pace of change in technology, but we're not going to change the absolute pie as big as we could have 20 years ago. Global energy demand, we can argue about whether this is exactly right, but the, the, the message here is nobody's, uh, everybody is growing. Some are growing faster than others, but the dinner table is still set with the same players. Nuclear is going up a bit, probably not very much here, but certainly in other parts of the world, in the developing world, particularly in China, where renewables are going up and they're going faster than some others. Uh, but they're coming from a lower base. So grass is growing tremendously here, growing tremendously around the world from a demand perspective, and we will have a much bigger place to play in that market. Coal, you're going to see it start bending downwards. I have a little bit to say about that. And liquids and transportation fuels are still growing. So everybody is still there. And that's still the same for us. Uh, you know, EIA is still there. And that's still the same for us. Uh, you know, EIA is updating their forecasts, and the numbers change a little bit. But we're not seeing the huge tectonic changes unless something really big changes. Now, uh, you know, Dave just pointed out, well, back in 2009, we didn't see fracking. Here we're not seeing the next technology. We're not seeing anything. And maybe it's in your garage, maybe it's in your lab, maybe it's via, maybe it's something. Uh, but until we see that, this is the world as we know it today. Uh, but it does mean that gas is growing, coal is not, nuclear is sort of in a holding pattern, 
Uh, and renewables are growing, but we're still reliant on petroleum uh, for a large. Uh, if we had had that conversation of the first part of the slides about uh, OPEC looking one direction, all the new supply looking another direction, and we're here, and we were back in 2009 or 2005, you know, we'd be hitting the panic button. Prices would be going way, way up. We were looking for new supplies. I'll tell a quick story. In 2005, I was in the government. I will tell a quick story. In 2005, I was in the government. I was the Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs. In 2005 was the big hurricanes in the Gulf, uh, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. And I got the glorious job of being in charge of the energy response. I was not the trailer lady. I was the energy lady. As I think back to those times, uh, I knew very quickly that you know, because we had a very responsible energy industry, they had shut down production in the Gulf, they could bring it back pretty quickly. They did. Uh, but gasoline prices were $4.50. Every member of Congress had me on speed dial. It was a very unpleasant time. Uh, but I knew we had tools in time. Uh, but I knew we had tools. We had our strategic petroleum reserve. We had other kinds of things uh, that we could do, and we did. And we released, along with a number of other countries, oil into the market, and prices eased, and the market began to get back in balance by the time everybody was heading out for the holidays. There's a bullet that I had no toolbox for, which was natural gas. Uh, as I'm looking at the situation, as we're in August, uh, I know that we're heading into a winter, whether it's cold or not cold, the draw on natural gas is coming. I'm looking at Europe, and they are in a huge, you know, uh, shortage of natural gas because they're having a, a fairly hot natural gas because they're having a, a fairly hot summer, and we've got no spare capacity in the United States whatsoever. I found myself on airplanes to every place you will never go on vacation, literally begging for natural gas. We sped up the permits for import terminals safely, but we sped them up uh, of of exporting. Uh, natural gas and the terminals that we actually sped up are now export terminals. So if you think about between 2005 and you know today, how the pace of that change. So there's going to be something else that's going to have that pace of change. But today we've got that uh, and those abundant resources, and we need to be able to use for our benefit, for the benefit of those energy poverty countries, and to the benefit of the climate. Uh, but if we hadn't figured all this out, four dollars and fifty cent gas would be our norm. Uh, and natural gas would be at $13 for us or something like that, right? And so we are deriving tremendous economic benefit from what economic benefit from what now we know we have. And by the way, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, that's a Rumsfeld thing, if anybody remembers that. I don't know what I don't know. I don't know. There's a great unknown. Well, what we don't know, we don't know what we have off the coast of the Atlantic. We don't even really know what we have in the Permian yet. We don't really ever are going to find out what we have off the coast of California practical decisions and what we do with them today, tomorrow, but also for that 2050 time frame. Because I don't, I mean, our, our political system breeds two and four year solutions, and we've got to breed 35 and 50 year solutions. And politicians don't like some of that, because it's not really where their constitu constituencies want to hear them. It's not really where their constitu constituencies want to hear them go. But we're the practical people, and we have to keep reminding them of that. So here's also a little bit of a reality check. Before we mess up the system of energy in this country by bad policy or malintended policy or even good policy with unintended consequences or malintended policy or even good policy with unintended consequences, here's one thing we have to keep in mind. The energy today is now foundational to our economy. In 2005, it was a liability. We were spending too much on it. We were importing it. It was a national security liability. Find more affordable natural gas. Uh, now today we have the petrochemical industry that is moving back into this country. We have other companies in Europe that are leaving industrialized Europe and are moving here, principally Germany. Germany has electricity prices four times higher than it is here. They're moving here, closer to natural, to natural gas. We have companies in Asia coming here so they can capitalize on what we have here. And so now this has not just become out of the liability column into the asset column, but now it's foundational to our economy. Every one of our 50 states is in the energy business in one way or another. They're all consumers, but if they're not producing, and a lot of them are, whether it's oil, gas, coal, renewables, if they're not doing that, they're in the supply chain. And so in a very short amount of time, you have seen energy now embed itself into our economy. 
And before we start making up new policy proclamations of where we want things to go, and that the government is going to discuss now what is driving our economy from a more than 1.5% growth to 3% growth. Throughout the recession, which was more protracted than it needed to be, the energy business hired, increased its employment 38%. Non-farm employment went down 3%, down 3%. I would argue, but I bet if there's an economist in the room, you could probably win the argument over me, that if they hadn't done that hiring, the recession might have been a depression. So now the energy business, and whether it goes through its ups and its downs, and we've seen very low oil prices and gas prices, it's still here, it's still part of the economy, and now it's found. And so as we think about policy, policy really matters. When we argued very strongly uh, for the oil export ban to be lifted, whether you agree with it or not, a lot of people said that's a stupid idea. We don't need it. Nobody's demanding more oil. And we said, you know what? We're preparing for that 20. And now look where we are. We're exporting oil all over the world. So policy does matter, even if it's not called on today. And I will tell you that I'm arguing very strongly right now, and many of you would disagree with me, and that's okay, that we should open up more acreage at our offshore. Many people in industry would say we don't would disagree with me, and that's okay, that we should open up more acreage at our offshore. Many people in industry would say we don't need it. And I said, you're right. You don't need it today. But don't you want to know that it's going to be there in that time frame of 20 years that you have to make your investment decision? Do you want to be here and be held a high account in the Gulf, or do you want to be in the Gulf of Guinea? Where do you want to be? Where do we want you to be if we want good environmental practice and extraction of the resources that are still going to be called upon in that time frame? I'd say we'd like at least a lot of it here. And of course, we see oil exports on the rise as a, as a uh, result of that policy. But we're less. That means our, you know, we talk about trade and balance all the time in Washington. God bless it. Uh, but, you know, we, you know, energy is the largest commodity that's reducing our trade imbalance because we're importing so much less of it and now we are selling more of it. But it has another dividend, which is if you look at everything from the brown all the way up to the red, that's what we think from the brown all the way up to the red, that's what we are getting from North America now in terms of our overall oil supply. So we're getting, obviously, here, conventional, unconventional, Canada, Mexico, <clears throat> And then we start getting into uh, the Persian Gulf, Venezuela, which is now falling off the map, and others. But what that means is if you look at 2000, looking at, oh my God, you know, we're, we're on this curve going the other direction, which is we're importing about 60% of our, our oil and we're going up to, I can't even see it being met, you know, it was just this way. And so we look at it from uh, a, a, a le you know, a, we have a little bit more breathing room. I'm not suggesting that now we can use any uh, victims, we are less victims to the volatility in the market because we supply more of our own. And I would argue if we get NAFTA right, that is going to be the opportunity for North America to be the center of the world's energy market. We have more oil, more gas, more renewables, more infrastructure that makes us the most competitive place on the world, more infrastructure that makes us the most competitive place on the planet, and certainly the world's most important energy supplier over time. Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, as we look at uh, where I came from in 2005 and not being able to find enough gas, now we are already going to be, we already are a net exporter of gas. And we have huge forecasts out to how much, and I can tell you that forecast is already wrong. We're going to be forecasting more. But what that means, it's not just that we're exporting gas to the countries that need it, whether it be Asia or Europe. And by the way, I have to say, you know, every uh, barrel that, uh, you know, whether it's oil or natural gas, but what that means, it's not just that we're exporting gas to the countries that need it, whether it be Asia or Europe. And by the way, I have to say, you know, every uh, barrel that, uh, you know, whether it's oil or natural gas that we displace of Mr. Putin's, I find a great deal of satisfaction in that, uh, and particularly over the longer term, as we look at where he's playing in the Middle East, it's uh, that we need to be thinking about strategically uh, as his pipelines are trying to expand pipelines into Europe to really lock up that market for the next 50 years, that our ability to use our exports to be able to bring some leverage or levity to the market is a good thing. But it's also a great thing for, there's about 300 new plants that are on the horizon, about 100 of those are in Texas, but we're seeing it all over the place. I mean, not just in the Gulf and Louisiana and Alabama, 
Uh, now we see new plants being produced or being uh, on the drawing block in Pennsylvania, Ohio, a new one in West Virginia. They're looking at establishing a whole new gulf. They're looking at establishing a whole new gulf, but in a different part of the country. Because if you have a hurricane, like we've had hurricanes before, and it can hit those facilities, that really could be an environmental disaster. It could be a lot of other things. So we need to diversify our manufacturing. And they're looking very hard at what that would mean for Appalachia there and bringing in a sort of a secondary hub for our country in the Appalachia region of our country. On the coal side of things, I like to say flat is the new up, uh, which is, you know, uh, 10 years ago, we would have said, you know, coal is going to maintain its uh, its share may go up a teeny bit, may go down a little bit, uh, but now we're cast a whole lot more down than they are right now. And the only reason they are is because of the competitive nature of some of our coal and the increase in exports. Will that continue? That depends. Uh, the export markets are there. There are a lot of markets that prefer our coal to others. But I can tell you when you look at India and China, but I can tell you when you look at India and China, even with the things that they are doing, if you listen to the Indians very carefully, they will say, we are going to develop all of our coal and hopefully use lots of yours until we are more energy self-sufficient. And yes, they are going to invest in renewables. And yes, they're going to do other things. But they are going to, as the largest democracy in the country, in the world, uh, that is their job number one. Uh, and they want to do it cleanly. I think it's a huge opportunity for us for clean coal technology. Because if they're going to use it, if the Chinese are going to use it, if the Brazilians are going to use it, South Africans are going to use it, We'd rather them be able to have access to the highest quality coal or them be able to have access to the highest quality coal or the highest quality coal and technology, but certainly the technology. And that should be developed here, deployed here, commercialized here. So let's just look quickly at some of the policies that I can figure out from this administration. I'm a very simple person and I've been able, very simple person, and I've been able to remember this from my vowels which is I think they're very focused on access uh, of all forms. And that means access onshore and offshore, but that means not just for oil and gas and coal, but also renewables. They're looking for offshore and onshore wind, uh, less so on solar. I think the solar market is not necessarily subsidy side of things, but large format uh, wind, but certainly uh, onshore and trying to figure out how on uh, whether it's the offshore leasing plan or what uh, the Interior Department controls onshore is getting a little bit out of the way and letting the industry decide where it wants to invest. Very focused on exports. How can they make it easier to export more of our energy around the world? And being very cognizant of the fact that, that also means technology and making sure not to put on export controls on the technologies that will allow the world to use energy more cleanly. <clears throat> very focused on infrastructure. You've heard the president say he has an infrastructure plan. It is, you know, bridges, bridges, you know, roads, inland waterways, all those kinds of things. But it involves energy. Uh, nobody in the energy business is asking for a government subsidy. They're asking for permitting relief so they can actually build things in a time frame that is relevant, relevant for their investors, relevant for their own bank line, their own P&L already through executive action. There is a task force that now is looking at large infrastructure projects and trying to speed the permitting along, adhering to all the environmental uh, you know, impacts that they have to analyze but really looking at permitting. And legislation is on the way to address this in a permanent way as well. They're looking to optimize that. That's a, that's a weird way to think about it. But as I said before, if you are in the driver's seat of the US economy, and you realize that energy is one third of investment in this country, you're going to optimize that. What can I build on top of that? How can I attract new investment to take advantage of that opportunity, that advanced manufacturing, and the other corollary benefits? And they're, and they're looking at getting rid of what they call unnecessary regulations. They have at every agency a task force looking at what regulations they can get rid of, what ones they can get rid of permanently, what ones they need to rescind and replace, what ones they can refine. Uh, and they're looking at the process by which the entire government does regulation and inserting a true cost benefit, a true cost benefit analysis into every single regulation that this administration uh, will be promulgating. But it's not easy. And this is wonky, but for those of you that study Washington, uh, you might appreciate this, that it gets e there's ways to do this easy, which means that it can be turned over in the next administration and make it a lot harder for the next administration to turn over. Quite frankly, in any administration, you should be doing both. 
uh, because if you only have four years, you're not going to do everything permanent and have it just on lockdown for the next administration. You should be doing what is in your interest for what you think needs to be done for the economy. And they've done that. They're doing some permit streamlining within their executive, some permit streamlining within their executive authorities. But for the longer term, durable stuff, it's embedded in tax reform and appropriations. It takes longer. And they'll have to get it done with about 18 months left in the administration so it can ultimately get litigated in the courts before they walk out of here, if they walk out of here on uh, Inauguration Day. On temporary, difficult, but broad and enduring. So what have they done so far? They've gotten rid of a fair amount of regulations. All of those that are on there right now are being replaced with something. They're trying to decide on some of these others what they will look like, but this is their map. This is what they're doing. They will get to all of these, some of them on the, they will get to all of these, some of them on the easy side and some of them on the harder, more durable side. I think you'll see certainly waters of the US, the clean power plan, some of those things will be done in the harder, more durable way. Some of the others will be done in the easier way. Legislation to watch in the energy space. Uh, we did it, right? No, we're on the first inning of tax reform. The IRS is just writing the tax rules. And so energy is a big part of that. So watch tax reform from, a, from your own companies, do your own personal stuff, watch tax reform because there's, there's eight more innings to go in tax reform. Uh, and certainly at least four or five it will mean for energy. Uh, there is a regulatory accountability act that is waiting to be put forward in the Senate. What will that do? It's already passed the house. It will permanently reform the regulatory process in this country. I think if this administration leaves and they do that, uh, that will be endure. That will be one of their most process by which this country develops its regulatory framework, uh, and that will be fairly significant. They're looking at some of these other things: Endangered Species, Clean Water Act. How can they refine them, make them more transparent, make them more industry friendly, but still upholding their intentional, their original intent? of clean water, clean air, protect. How can they refine them, make them more transparent, make them more industry friendly, but still upholding their intentional, their original intent of clean water, clean air, protect flora and fauna. Uh, and you know, if you, if you listen to Secretary Zinke, who's responsible for a couple of these, he's very intent on that. Whatever you think of Administrator Pruitt, his, uh, you know, he does have a, a certain view of what the Clean Water Act should do, what the state should do, and what the federal government should do. I wanted to close with something because I want us to get talking, uh, which is what are we witnessing today? Are we witnessing environmental activism or anti-energy anti activism today? Uh, and anti-energy activism today. Uh, and it's not you know, sustainability, it's not efficiency, it's not renewables. The activists that are out there, what are we really seeing? I mean, I was alive in the 1970s. I remember when we had our first big body of environmental law we needed it. We had dirty air. We had dirty water. Uh, it was EPA. Uh, we also did a lot of other things because we were standing in gas lines. But we had a problem. And we now have the Clean Water Act, Safe Water Drinking Act, the Clean Air Act. They were put there for a very good reason, and they have only been refined only slightly. If you can imagine, you know, today in 2018, how much different we look than what we did in 1970. Looks different. We all are different. Uh, and we've got to bring these things up to today's standards. Does Congress want to do that? No. Uh, so we have an interesting conundrum. What happened since we passed all of those environmental laws? Well, I think, you know, we tend to forget that we've actually made some progress. We've grown, we tend to forget that we've actually made some progress. We've grown the economy about 150% over the same period of time, between about 1980 when finally everything came into effect till about last year, we've about doubled the amount of vehicle miles we're traveling in our cars. We have seen our population grow by about 40%. The economy have been growing. Yet energy consumption is only growing by 25%. So it shows from an energy per capita perspective, we've become so much more efficient. CO2 emissions have not nearly kept pace with energy increases and all of the vehicle miles traveled. Again, a metric of efficiency, technology, innovation. And at the same time, looking at those things that the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, basically the Clean Air Act were intended to reduce. The big bad pollutants, the SOX, the NOx, particulate matter, are down by 65%. I can tell you when you put that slide up and you talk to our friends in Europe, it makes them crazy because they don't want to admit that we've done anything good for the environment matter are down by 
I can tell when you put that slide up and you talk to our friends in Europe, it makes them crazy because they don't want to admit that we've done anything good for the environment here. And quite frankly, our numbers look better than their numbers on these metrics. So companies are stepping up, right? I mean, you're here in New York, center of Wall Street. I mean, you see a lot of the companies part of the conversation. They don't want to be the problem. They want to be part of the conversation. They want to prove to their analysts, to their investors, that they're doing the right thing. But here's what we're saying. You know, out in the, you know, in the field, as they say, they're seeing no mining, no fracking, no power plants, no nuclear, no this, no that. Uh, we have Dakota Access and people protesting. We're seeing, uh, we don't want a transmission line. We don't want nuclear plants. We don't want anything. You know, it used to be NIMBY, not in my backyard. Now it's build absolutely nowhere, anywhere near anyone, banana. Uh, they don't want anything. It's not NIMBYism. It's we don't want to build anything, you know. And if you really talk to some of the most strident activists, whatever strident activists, whatever their motivation, it's not on planet Earth. And so we're at a place where we have to look out to 2050. We know what the energy demand growth is going to be. We know where it's going to be. We know we're a good actor in this business. And yet we're facing big problems at home, particularly in pipelines. Those are all the pipelines that we have today. But all of a sudden, we don't want to build pipelines anymore. Gas yes, is bringing down our emissions. Well, if we don't transport it by pipe, are we going to transport it by rail? I don't think so. I think we're going to revert to other forms of energy. And so the very things that are going to help us continue to be more energy secure and cleaner are the things that people are military, militating against. And my friends in the environmental community, I just can't get them not doing yourselves any favors right now. We're on the right pathway. Are we perfect? No. But we need to recognize that things